I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We end the hour with Venezuela. President Nicolás Maduro addressed the United Nations General Assembly Wednesday, just one day after Trump accused him of corruption and announced new sanctions against members of his inner circle, including Maduro's wife, Celia Flores. This is Trump speaking to the U.N. General Assembly Tuesday. Not long ago, Venezuela was one of the richest countries on Earth. Today, socialism has bankrupted the oil-rich nation and driven its people into abject poverty. In that spirit, we ask the nations gathered here to join us in calling for the restoration of democracy in Venezuela. Today, we are announcing additional sanctions against the repressive regime targeting Maduro's inner circle and close advisors. Trump said Wednesday that he would be willing to meet with President Maduro and that all options are on the table to help end the political, economic and humanitarian chaos in Venezuela. This is Maduro responding to Trump Wednesday night. A pesar de todas las diferencias, Despite all of the differences, which could be considered abysmal, the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro Moros, would be willing, I am willing, to reach out my hand to the president of the United States and sit down to talk about the issues of bilateral differences and the issues of our region. The U.N. visit comes nearly two months after Maduro survived a coup attempt, when two drones loaded with explosives detonated above him as he gave a nationally televised speech at a military event in Caracas. It was the first known attempted assassination by drone strike against a sitting head of state. Earlier this month, The New York Times reported Trump administration officials held multiple secret meetings with rebel Venezuelan military officers last year to discuss plans to overthrow Venezuelan President Maduro. The secret meetings about a possible coup included a Venezuelan military commander who's on a U.S. government sanctions list of corrupt Venezuelan officials. The Times reports the discussion stalled after Trump administration officials reportedly decided not to assist in a military coup in Venezuela. Well, for more, we're joined by Vijay Prashad here in the studio. Studio, director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, chief editor of Left Word Books. He's also the chief correspondent of Globetrotter, author of The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, and co-editor of Land of Blue Helmets, the United Nations and the Arab World. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great Thanks. to have you with us. Um, so, Vijay, you were last night at an event at Riverside Church. Thousands of people packed in. Frankly, I couldn't get in. I was right there. <laughs> you were inside, yeah. though. Uh, and there was a surprise appearance by President Maduro. He had just addressed the United Nations and said what we heard him say. Trump was there earlier and uh, said he's imposing more sanctions against Venezuela. Venezuela. Um, and this all comes after this coup attempt. Uh, talk about the significance of what's happening, why the U.S. is taking the approach it does to Venezuela and Maduro's response. Well, let's bring Iran into the conversation, Amy, and it's great to be back. Um, there have been two attacks on two military parades, in August in Venezuela and this month in Iran. And the United States government has not said anything of sympathy, even though about 30 people were killed in the attack in Iran. In fact, on the day of the attack in Iran, uh, Trump's advisor, Rudy Giuliani, reiterated a call for the overthrow of the Iranian government. I mean, what we're seeing is quite curious. At the United Nations, Mr. Trump apparently suggested that state sovereignty, in other words, the integrity of a state, a member state of the United Nations, should be the main principle by which governments, you know, uh, take care of their policies. In other words, he was defending what some call economic nationalism. But when it comes to places like Iran or Venezuela, the principle of state sovereignty is not respected at all. What we see instead is a kind of gunboat diplomacy, but really without diplomacy. I mean, it's mainly gunboat. And that's been the attitude towards Venezuela. It's been so harsh, uh, the economic war against Venezuela, that Nicolas Maduro has not been able to come and address the UN General Assembly since 2015. So this is the first time that Maduro, under immense pressure from the United States, was able to come to the opening of the UN General Assembly and speak to uh, the, you know, the Parliament of Nations, as it were. So can you talk about, uh, Vijay, what are the conditions in Venezuela today? 
Well, the conditions are quite difficult for lots of people. Uh, it has been under immense sanctions, sanctions that are as harsh as they have been on Cuba at the worst time. Uh, plus, of course, commodity prices have decreased dramatically, in other words, particularly oil prices. And in this situation, the Venezuelan government has had much of its options reduced. So the situation is bad. I mean, there's inflation and so on. But it's highly exaggerated in the media, particularly in the United States. I mean, just uh, two months ago, there was a march of farmers, for instance, from around the country uh, to Caracas. They had come with a set of demands. And the government met the farmers. They made some provisions about how to tackle uh, the agricultural crisis inside Venezuela. By the way, an agricultural crisis that's global. I mean, after all, there was a march of farmers in India at the same time. Uh, the government was not able to act upon the proposals. Farmers went on hunger strike. Government met with them again. And then they came to an agreement. What I'm just trying to say is, of course, there's difficulty. You know, let's not uh, duck that. But this difficulty is not entirely endogamous. It's not coming from inside Venezuela, as if, you know, Venezuelan socialism is the culprit, as Trump said. I mean, this is a country that is under a kind of war, and we have to see it like that. We have to understand the situation in Iran as well as a place under siege. Again, this is not unfamiliar to what's happening even in Argentina, where the peso has collapsed against the dollar. So there's a focus when we talk about places like Venezuela or Iran, not seeing that there's actually been a global hit against countries like Turkey, Argentina, South Africa, India, as the U.S. interest rates have risen. For, for a series of reasons, there's a real problem in these countries. Is the U.S. working with Latin American countries against Venezuela, like Colombia, where it's going to be building a number of bases, like Honduras, Brazil? Um, are they forming a block? Well, they have already a block. It's called the Lima Group, and it was set up a couple of years ago in Lima, Peru. Um, it's interesting, though, Amy, that the United States has been pushing not just Trump, but also Obama, for a kind of military solution. Trump is far more aggressive in his language. Again, yesterday in the United Nations, he said that the military option is not off the table. He said that in the corridors. Well, on Wednesday, five conservative Latin American governments and Canada's prime minister met in New York, signed a complaint with the International Criminal Court asking to investigate Maduro on charges of crimes against humanity. This is true. It's the first time governments have done this. But just to finish about the Lima Group, is despite the fact that the United States has been pushing for a military option, the Lima Group this week released a statement where they signed on to the statement saying they are opposed to a military intervention. Even <laughs> Colombia, which didn't sign the statement, said it agrees with the spirit of the statement. It is, of course, true that five of these countries have, you know, approached the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Now, but look at the hypocrisy of it. Uh, Mr. Trump has just attacked the ICC, mm -hmm. the International Criminal Court. He's questioned its jurisdiction. And then a couple of days later, his close Latin American allies and the Canadians put this complaint forward. You know, Amy, it's so hard to take the world uh, at face value these days. <laughs> Well, let's go to Trump uh, uh, speaking about the International Criminal Court during his uh, U.N. address on Tuesday. The United States will provide no support and recognition to the International Criminal Court. As far as America is concerned, the ICC has no jurisdiction, no legitimacy, and no authority. The ICC claims near-universal jurisdiction over the citizens of every country violating all principles of justice, fairness, and due process. We will never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy. So that's uh, Trump speaking just on, on Tuesday about the International Criminal Court, saying that he will not relinquish American sovereignty to a global bureaucracy. I mean, you know, we are in a situation now, Nermin, where uh, the United States government is becoming increasingly isolated. And I think Americans need to understand that. You know, whether it's the peace agreement in Korea, where the United States played almost no role, or it's the issue of isolating Iran and Venezuela, there's immense pushback against U.S. policy, not only from the Europeans, you know, where I think it's important to say that they are very disheartened by the Iran policy, but also by other countries associated with the non-aligned movement. You know, even close 
allies. Trump named Israel, India, Saudi Arabia, and Poland as the friends of the United States. I mean, it's an extraordinary small list. Uh, but even India is not entirely uh, given to the idea that there should be harsh policy versus Iran or Venezuela. And Saudi Arabia? And Saudi Arabia, let's not talk about Saudi Arabia, Amy. That we can go on for about, you know, at least a half an hour. It's such a complicated place. I don't even see why we take it so seriously. Well, that's good, because we will do a post-show, and we will uh, post this online in the WebEx column with Vijay Prashad, um, who's director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and chief editor of Left Word Books, chief correspondent of Globetrotter, author of The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. That does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! has a broadcast engineer opening full-time in New York. Apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Carla Wills, Laura Gottesdiener, Tammy Warnoff, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Libby Rainey, I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. Thanks so much for joining us.